Hi, my name is David Orlovsky. I'm originally from Long Island, New York, and I moved to Israel in 1988, August of 1988. And uh, an interesting thing happened. I was living in a community in the greater New York area, but of the tri-state area, you know. Um, we from New York call that in town, you know, unless you come from Flatbush, you know, then, you know, Queens and Long Island is, of course, out of town, you know. But except for Muncie, but uh, but if you, uh, I, I was from the New York area. I was living in a town in the New York area, and I was asked to speak to a ladies' group on uh, one of the Shabbosim during the summer, and um, and and I raised the following issue. I'll never forget this because it really went over pretty dramatically. I said, Reb Moshe Feinstein says that it's a Mitzvah's ase that's mekuyim to live in Eretz Yisrael b'zman azeh. What, what does that mean? Uh, mitzvah's ase is mekuyim. You know, mechuyiv. It's not like matzah on on Pesach where you have to eat it. It's not. Um, it's not uh, like um, um, saying Krishma or putting on tefillin. It's like tzitzis. You don't have to wear tzitzis. If you wear a four cornered garment, then you have to put tzitzis on it. But you don't have to wear tzitzis technically, right? But if you do, you get a mitzvah sase. It's, it's called a mitzvah sase. It's mekuyim. So, um, uh, so I said, you don't have to, but if you do, you get a mitzvah sase. I said, what would you do if your kid came home from school and he's not wearing tzitzis? And you'd say, how come you're not wearing tzitzis? And he says, well, mom, you know, it's mitzvah sase. It's mekuyim. I don't really have to. If you, if you wear a doll confess, I'm not wearing a doll confess. I don't have to, you know. What would you say to your kid? I'll go put on a pair of tzitzis. <laughs> what kind of business is this? Put on a pair of tzitzis. I said, it's a mitzvah says mekuyim. I mean, if you do it, you get a mitzvah say. I'm not telling anybody, I said, that you should move to Eretz Yisrael. My question is, did you ever ask a shayla? Did you speak to somebody about it? It could be you have very legitimate reasons for not doing this mitzvah say. But if it's a mitzvah say, it's mekuyim, why wouldn't you do it? That was part of an hour shear that I gave. The next week, people were stopping me in the street. You told my wife we have to move to Israel? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't tell him that. I said, Reb Moshe said, it's Mitzvah Sase, it's Mekuyim. Ah, people quote all kinds of things in Reb Moshe's name. I said, I could show it to you. It's in print. <laughs> you no, know? ah, it's not the point. Not the point. Uh, I, I don't think it applies today. Or that. I said, I didn't say that you have to do it. All I said was, ask Shayla, like you have anything else. And I was surprised by the level of hostility that this throwaway line evoked. And I realized that I was, I was hitting on something that was a sore point. It was obviously something that was, that was very sensitive, you know? Story number one. Story number two. These people come to visit us from America. It's always nice when people come to visit us. And, um, you know, because when you move to Israel, you leave your family behind. For some people, that's a motivation. But, uh, you know, uh, it's hard. You're here, you're here by yourself. When you have a family simcha, you know, you have a birthday party, there's nobody here. It's hard. So this couple, this family comes to visit. And the wife says, the apartments here are so small. I said, yes, they are. I had a nice two-family house with a deck and a backyard. Yeah, you're right. The apartments here are small. And it's so hot. I said, yeah, we're, we're in the Middle East. You know, it's probably... Similar temperature to like Miami, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it can be hot. And it's so dusty. Why is it so dusty here? I said, I'm sorry, the place was abandoned for 2,000 years. The girl only comes in twice a week, you know, so we haven't gotten to everything yet. But we're cleaning it up. <laughs> it takes a while, you know. And then she asked an interesting question. She said, then why do you live here? Now, this question is similar to two other questions that I get asked. Um... We have, uh, we have a lot of Shabbos guests. Um, in America, you don't really get to do the mitzvah of Hafnos Orchem like you do here. Occasionally you do. Oh, we invite over a family for a Shabbos meal or something like that, but that's not... I'm talking about people who have no place to go. I'm talking about parents who send their children here, spend $20,000 on tuition, and then their children are tossed out on the street <laughs> on Shabbos and have no place to go. And they call you up. They probably should have no place to go, you know? They have to go down to the, to the wall and wait for somebody to pick them up. <laughs> Put on a backpack, you know? You know? But they, they have no place to go. So they call up. So, okay, our, our rule is that 
we stop when one kid is on the lap. When we have to keep one kid on the lap, already we stop. Now, considering my youngest is seven, that's already quite, you know, quite a commitment, you know. But okay, we we'll usually have a lot of guests. And people come and say, wow, you have a lot of guests. And I said, yes, we do. Isn't it hard? I said, yes, it is. It is. You know, it's a lot of shopping and a lot of cooking and a lot of serving, a lot of entertaining, a lot of cleaning up afterwards, you know. Yeah, it's hard. So what do you do it? Now, there are people who come and they try to count all of my children. Baruch Hashem, we have a lot of them, you know, and uh, they're looking around, you know, and they say, wow, you have a lot of kids. I said, yes, I do. Isn't it hard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's very hard. Then why do you do it? And all three questions are really predicated on the same essential premise. And that is, why would you want to do something if it's hard? And it's, it's true, by the way. It happens to be an excellent question. I was talking to a group from Los Angeles. Um, Jewish kids. Not particularly committed. Um, there were people there who were, who were uh, actors, directors, business people. Uh, the head cheerleaders for the Lakers was a Jewish girl years ago. I don't know. Just, um, that's a basketball team, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, and, uh, you know, a typical cross-section of Jewish life, you know. And, uh, and I said, you know, the reform have a concept. Uh, it's hard to talk about reform, you know, uh, theology, because part of the theology is there's no official theology. But this was... Um, written up by a Reform Rabbi in the Jewish Week. I read it. I had two kids over my house from Reform High School here in Israel. They said it. Somebody told me they saw it on the Reform website. So I guess as close as you can get to doctrine, yeah, you know, in a doctrineless movement, yeah. You know. They said, we don't think of them as the Ten Commandments. We think of them as the Ten Suggestions. Maybe don't kill. Try not to steal. You know, see if you can stay away from my wife. You know, suggestions. Ideas for living, you know. We call them mitzvos. We haven't changed from commandments. We start with commandments. Mitzvos, commandments. And I asked this group, why are they still commandments? So somebody said to me, well, um, if you're commanded to do it, so psychologically you don't want to do it, and then it's harder and you get more reward. I said, you mean you thought Judaism was too easy? 613 commandments are such a breeze. Let's see if we can tie one of your hands behind your back and make it harder by giving you a psychological handicap. Now you understand where the reform is coming from. This is not a commandment. So someone said to me, well, if it's not a commandment, people will feel like they don't have to do it. I said, I got news for you. Most Jews today don't feel like they have to do it anyway. So, uh, so that doesn't seem to be a motivation. Why do we call them commandments? Th there's a mistake, I think. And the mistake is that if something is difficult... That means it's by nature less enjoyable. And if something is easier, it's by definition better. Now, the fact is, we know this isn't true. We can see this. It is a hot day. Hot, humid, sticky day. The place to be is inside your house, next to an air conditioner, with a cold lemonade, and read something and relax. And yet you'll find young men choose instead to go outside on hot asphalt and run back and forth and sweat and bounce the ball trying to get it into a basket. Well, that's harder. But they'll tell you because it's better. They'll tell you because it's better. There's no question about it, you know. Um, I remember when I used to teach at Discovery, so, uh, so they, they were talking about a similar idea, you know, and, and somebody told the story. They said, if you ask parents, what's the greatest pleasure? They'll say their children. And you ask them, what's your greatest source of pain? They'll say my children. So a guy says, so I was one time teaching the class. I said to this young woman, I said, what's your parents' greatest source of pleasure? She says, me. I said, what's their greatest source of pain? She says, my brother. <laughs> but there's this, there's this idea that, yeah, it's difficult. It's hard to get married, and it's hard to have children, and it's hard to make Shabbos. And it's hard to make Pesach, and it's hard, it's hard. But maybe it's more fulfilling. Maybe people who go outside and play basketball will tell you it's less comfortable, but it's more enjoyable. And it's, the Masil Sashar in Perak Dalit says an amazing thing. He says, the Shleme Hadas, people who are completely in touch with reality, understand that Shlemus is the greatest thing. And if Shlemus is the greatest thing, 
then the worst thing is not being Shalim. That's it. If this is the greatest thing, then not having that is not the greatest thing. If the greatest thing is to be married, then the worst thing is not to be married. Not that somebody hits you in the head with a rock. You understand? Which is, by the way, not, not a very positive experience. I, some people will say being married is similar, but the, I'm not talking about that. You know, I'm saying the person will tell you, marriage is a wonderful thing, then not being married is the worst possible thing. There's a commandment today, the 11th commandment. It's called take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. Relax. I need to chill. My parents never chilled. My parents had this attitude of we have to work to be able to get enough money to be able to send our kids to yeshiva, to be able to pay our mortgage, to be able to pay our bills. You know, we don't just chill. When I was in Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim, Moshe Chait said that he heard from his Rebbe, Rebbe David uh, Leibowitz, that he said, he someone said to the Bachim, he says, you guys don't even know how to bottle. <laughs> so when we bottled, we did something. You guys just, just don't do anything. You just do nothing. It's scary. It's scary. People end up with nothing. And then you end up with people who have lives that I'd like to say it's a work in progress. That's the nicest thing I can think of. They always say that about a kid, a kid who hasn't done anything. They say, he has a lot of potential. <laughs> I said, I'd rather find someone who's starting to actualize their potential. <laughs> you know? well, something that has a lot of potential, we, the fancy term for that is called chayma You know what I mean? We have a lot of raw material, and we could do something with it. We could make something out of it. It's a pile of clay. But if you make it into a vase, you know, then you, you've, you've done something with it. You've, you've maximized the potential. The truth is, that ideally you live your life with a certain amount of angst. Because you have to look at yourself at each point and say, is this the best that I can do? I have this with kids who come to Israel to learn, you know, whether it's in yeshiva or seminary, and they come back. And people give them that smile. Yeah, I remember when I went to Israel. I remember my year. Don't worry, it'll wear off and you'll become like everybody else. And most people do. Most people do. There is a small percentage of people who say, I don't want to live a life like everybody else. I want to live an exceptional life. And by the way, make no mistake about it. At the end of our life, we all wanted to have lived exceptional lives. Nobody at their funeral wanted them to tell the truth. <laughs> we want to hear, we were somebody exceptional, we did great things, and we were so special, you know. But if you want to have lived an exceptional life, then you have to be in a position where you're living an exceptional life. Are you living the life now that you want to look back at and be remembered for? And most people don't live the life they want. They live the life that happens. And they end up someplace. They end up in a job and they end up living somewhere and they end up this. Do they sit down and think and ask themselves, where's the best that I can be? Because what if it's scary? What if the best that I could be right now is I have to make a change in my life and I have to go someplace and I have to do something? I don't know. I don't know. I'm comfortable where I am. You know? I've, I've, this is what I know and this is where I am and this is what I've always done and that's what I know. It's not great. It's not particularly exceptional, but it's okay. It's what I know. How about having an exceptional life? which is what we really want to live. My father passed away. So, you know, when you sit shiva, you know, you tell a lot of the same stories, you know. And when there was a lonely action, one of my brothers said to me, you know, Dad ran a flower shop in Brooklyn for 50 years, and nobody came to speak about that. They came to speak about this act of chesed or this act of tzedak or something. And, I, and he said to me, most of what we do in our life is not remembered after we're gone. And I said, you're right. The, the exceptional people are people who make most of their lives that moment. And so most of their life is something that's lived on a higher level. Is it harder to have a lot of children than not? Yeah. Is it harder to have a lot of Shabbos guests? Yeah. Is it harder to live in Israel? It is. I, I don't care what anybody says. It's difficult. My grandfather came from Vengrov, Poland to America, never learned English. He was a Grina, you know, my father had to pull himself up by his bootstraps. He had to make it on his own. And I grew up in America. I was an American. I moved here. I'm my grandfather all over again. You know, my kids have to do what my parents did. You know, they have to make it on their own. And, and it's hard. I'm not going to tell you it's not hard. 
The question is, can you live a better life here or there? That's the question a person has to ask himself. Is it easy over there? Definitely easy. I go back to visit. I go back to speak, you know. And uh, I know the language. I know the signs, you know. Um, people uh, drive, if not like a first world country, at least a second world country, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's easier. For sure it's easier. Everything's marked. <laughs> There's prices on everything, you know. Life is easier. I don't know if it's better. But it's definitely easier. And I'm not here to tell anybody what they should do or they shouldn't do. But a person has to look at themselves and say, am I deciding to stay in my country of origin because it's better or because it's easier? That's the question. A person should live the best life that they can. A person should live the life that they're going to look back on and say, wow, this is the best. Now, maybe you have considerations and people have different considerations where this is not the best thing. And I respect that. But a person has to ask themselves, did I ask the question or was I scared by the question because I was afraid what the answer might be? That's the scary part. The unknown is scary. You know? Uh, if you've ever come to visit Eretz Shell, you stayed in a hotel, you had a buffet, it's a whole different experience when you live here. <laughs> You're not going to be sitting at the buffet. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to live here, and, and there's challenges. But there's also opportunities. And, uh, and sometimes the best things are the ones that require effort. Require effort. Where's the Eicha of Moshe Rabbeinu? What, the Eicha of Tishabav? Of, of Yirmiyahu. How could it be Yerushalayim was destroyed? Three people used that term, the Chazal tell us. The first one was Moshe. Where's the Eicha? Eicha, Esau Levadi. How can I carry by myself all of your problems? Let's set up judges. That's the Eicha? Rashi says, because the people should have said, of course it's hard for us to just go to you, Moshe but we want to go to you because that's the best. We want to have the best. I don't care if we have to wait a line. I don't care if it's more difficult. But you didn't care about that. You want it easy. That's the source of Tisha B'av. Is it easier in the Midbar? I've got the Ananiya Kavod. I've got the Mun. I've got the Be'er. I've got everything here. It's easier. Definitely easier. Do you want easy or do you want better? And all of life is going to come down to that challenge. Have you ever spoken to people later on in life, who say, I wish I could live my life over. Why didn't you do it right the first time? Because I just did the next thing, and I did the next thing, and I took what was easy. If a person wants to change and live an exceptional life, then a person has to be prepared to ask yourself, what's the best life that I can live? That's the challenge. We're in a time of destruction, and destruction comes about because all it takes for evil to grow is for good men to remain silent. People didn't make a decision. And now every single one of us has to look into our lives and say, is this the best I could be doing, or could I be doing better? Is it hard? Is it scary? It's very hard. I'm here 25 years. It's hard and it's scary. There's no question about it. But maybe it's better. Sometimes people come and talk to me about Aliyah and I point out some of the problems and they say, but you live there. I said, I have to live there. I can't breathe anyplace else. You know, it's, there's a Kedusha in that show. Rabbi Zev Leff tells an unbelievable story. I read, it, I read it written up. When he was being offered the position in Moshev Matasyo to become a Rav and he was a Rav in Miami. So uh, he went to Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky and Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and they both told him, if you can find something in that show, that's where the future is. It's more intense. It's more real. I was in a camp. <laughs> I was in a camp with a camp driver. He said to me, what hotel are you staying at? I said, man, ani Israeli, ani garpo, lama tocho shevsh, ani amerikai. <laughs> so he says, you live here? Were you crazy? I'm trying to get a green card and get out of here, and you live here? I said, well, uh, this is our home. This is our land. This is our people. <laughs> He says, it's so, so much trouble and there's so much taxes and there's so much economy and there's so many problems. I said, you're right. Real life is hard. And we pass by a chassid and he says, you see that guy? He hates my guts. I said, I don't know if he hates your guts or not. I said, well, I got a brother. He hates my guts. But I'd give up my life for him in a second. 
And he says to me, and I'd give up my life for him. And I said, we are one sick, dysfunctional family. <laughs> Somebody said to me, look at all the hatred. Look at the hatred. I said, you know what? Let the guy who hates me be a Jew. Because <laughs> at least they're Rachmanim b'nei Rachmanim. You know? There's, uh, there's so much good in people. Yeah, it's difficult. But when you see how everybody here cares about each other, I don't care who they are or what they are, everybody cares and everybody is concerned. You know, some people go about it perhaps the right way, some people go about it perhaps the wrong way. But everybody cares. And it's one family. Somebody said to me, you know, Israelis are rude. I said, that's true. I said, do you hear a mother on the phone? Hi, hello, hi, how are you? Hold on a second. You kids better hold it down. I'm going to give it to you. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we're polite with strangers. With family, we take, uh, we take liberties. And here we're all family. It's tough. It's tough, especially if they've lived family behind. But th there's, there's family here. There's a more meaningful life. It's harder. And that's the question a person has to ask himself. Am I doing what's easy or am I doing what's meaningful? And if we choose to live a more meaningful life, then ultimately our children and our grandchildren will be able to turn around and live in a better and a greater world than the one we're in.